today we're going to be, uh, Leigh and I haven't been up here in a few weeks. It's been, I guess, what, about three weeks. We've had a lot going on in the church. But um, we are continuing on with our uh, teachings that we've been doing, the team teachings that we've been doing on how to appropriate the finished work of the cross in every area of your life. And so we want to start an area today. We were going to be talking today about the balance of grace and faith because, you know, there has to be a balance. You have the faith movement, and then you have the grace movement, and if you're out of whack on either side, then it's going to be wrong. And so what we want to do is we're going to teach you the balance, but the Lord really put it in our heart that we needed to teach first about the understanding and understanding faith and what is faith and where do we get faith and how do we operate in faith. So we're going to be talking about those things today because, you know, um, it's important for you to understand, you know, I know there was the, the faith movement that came along, um, and then the grace movement that came along, and, and you know, the ex- extreme grace people get to the point where they say, well, everybody's saved, you don't have to do anything, you know, and that's just not the case. And then you have the faith people that say, well, if you confess it 4,000 times, then it'll happen for you, and you'll move God, and he'll do something, and you'll, you'll make him move. Well, no, neither one of those are correct. Faith is just appropriating what Jesus has already paid the price for. That's all it is, is we are putting into place through our part of believing and receiving and accepting the finished work of the cross, right? So it's not making him move. It's saying, man, I believe I receive everything he's already purchased for me. That's what true faith really is. It's not, man, if I can just confess enough, and if I could just do this enough, and if I can perform enough, then maybe God will be pleased enough with me that then maybe he will heal me. No. By his stripes, you were healed. So we're going to break this down, and um, I want to, we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, the patriarchs and the, the, the old covenant and, and the understanding of faith in the old covenant and what happens in the new covenant. But in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, now, you know, Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. So you can read all of that on your own. It's long, and we won't go there and read all of the different testimonies there and and everything it says, but we will break parts of it uh, down and talk about that. But in verse 6, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Well, I think we can all agree on that, but what does that mean? Does it mean you have to perform? No. Does it mean you have to believe? Yes. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Right? So we just have to, we have to have relationship. You know, you can't have faith in somebody that you can't trust. And you can't trust somebody that you haven't spent time with. So we've been talking all along about the value of spending time with, first we talked about the Father and the relationship with the Father and the love of the Father and what he had for us. And then we had talked about Jesus and who Jesus is and then who we are in Jesus. And then we talked about the Holy Spirit, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, and then the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We went through all of the foundation so that you could have a better relationship and understanding of the Godhead. All right? So... Um, We have to diligently seek him, but to do that, you spend time in relationship with him. You get to know him, and you just love on him, like we did today when we sang that love song to Jesus. And you get your focus off of you, and you get it onto him, and telling him how much you adore him, and how much you love him, and how much he means to you. And then that's when relationship is developed, and then faith can begin, because it's out of trust. So I want to talk, let's go to the very first one we should talk about is Abraham, because he's the father of faith, right? How many of you know that? Abraham is considered the father of faith. Well, a few of you know that, about four. But anyway, Abraham Abraham is the father of faith. So in in Romans chapter 4, we're going to read the first three verses. Now, there's Romans chapter 4. You really need to read the whole thing because it gets into talking about works of the law and, and things and what Abraham did uh, differently, and, and it breaks all of that down. And we don't have time to get into all of these. But in Romans chapter 4, verse 1, it says, 
What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, the father of faith, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, by whose works? His works. If he was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? It says that Abraham believed God, and that was accounted unto him for righteousness. This is, this is the simplicity of the gospel of faith. He just believed God and that he knew that there wasn't anything of his works that he could do, right? He believed God. Simple faith. Simple faith. Talk about Abraham some more here in, uh, in Romans 4, verse uh, 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Who contrary to hope, in hope, believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief, but, it was, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully convinced, and that's in the, in the New King James, if the King James says, and being fully persuaded that what he, had, he, the Lord, had promised, he, the Lord, was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. So he believed God. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. You know, we are to believe God. You know, that sounds sometimes just like that's real elementary. You know, just believe God. Do you love God? Mm-hmm. Do you, is he your Lord? And is, did he give Jesus? Do you believe he sent Jesus to die on the cross and he's your heavenly father? Mm-hmm. Well, when it comes to uh, events happening in this world and happening around your life, do we really believe God? Do we take him at his word? Or do, are we just, when things are going hunky-dory and things are looking rosy and everything looks just like it should be, uh, uh, do we believe God? Or do we believe God when he tells us or puts something in our heart? Do we believe that is the case no matter what the circumstances that come along? No matter what tries to come along and steal our joy or our peace or, or what naysayers say, do we believe God? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. How many of you believe God? I mean with a capital B, believe God in here. Amen. So, you know what? I know this may be oversimplified and this may not even be 100% correct. But in my book, we either believe God or we believe the devil. Whose report are you going to believe? Because in almost everything in this life, you've got a choice. You're going to believe something that lines up with the Word of God, or are you going to believe something that doesn't line up with the Word of God? So the choice belongs to us. You know, it's so important that we understand. You know, he understood what it meant to call those things that were not as though they were. So what is it you look at and you believe, and what is it you don't focus on? Well, he called those things that were not as though they were, believing in his heart that what God promised God would perform. And he did not, what, consider his own body or the deadness of Sarah's womb because he was already 100 years old. Man, he knew there's no way I'm going to be able to perform. <laughs> but God promised. And God gave him the ability to do his part as he believed God would perform and make it happen because God told him, you know, you remember for a while there, he got into a bit of unbelief and he decided to create an Ishmael, which caused a lot of problems. But when he finally got a hold of the understanding, when God told him enough that your descendants will be greater than the numbers of the sand and the seas, and it will come through a child through Sarah, 
He finally said, okay, I believe. I believe, and I'm not even going to consider what my body is doing. When you're believing for healing, you better not consider what your body's doing. You better believe God that by his stripes you were healed. And that's the only verse you need to stand on. You can get a bunch of verses. But if you stand on that one alone, that's enough to get the job done because you're not getting the job done in the first place. You're just tapping into the one who got the job done. Amen? It's the same thing with finances. He became poor that I might be rich. If that's the one you stand on, then praise God. You find something that you can hold on to because it's the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing what? By the word of God. And that when you spend time relating to the word of God, then your faith is built up by the word. See, you don't even get faith in faith. You don't even have to work your faith. You just believe God. You just believe, you've got to get an understanding of this, the true understanding of what faith really is. You know, and I want to talk about another part of Abraham. Sure. One more thing I want to say about that is I was walking in this morning. I'd already been in and had to go back out into the vehicle and get some stuff out this morning. And it dropped in my spirit out of nowhere. But, you know, do we really believe that God is going to perform those things that he said he would perform. In other words, he's the one that does the work. Or do we see God as a consultant in our lives? That word consultant dropped in my spirit. It's like consultant. You know how people take jobs and everything else and they become a consultant. A lot of people leave, you know, leave careers and they later on become consultants to corporations and you know, consulting with the knowledge and wisdom and understanding they've acquired over the years working for different corporations or companies or businesses or whatever. And they you know, make pretty good money and, and consult and they set their hours and doing stuff like that. But God is not, I mean, yes, he is, he is wisdom itself. And he is not our consultant. He is our daddy, and he's told us, and the word tells us, and this is what Abraham believed, that he was, Abraham con was convinced. He, was, he, he knew beyond any shadow of a doubt. He was fully persuaded, not just per persuaded, but fully persuaded that what God said and promised, he would perform it. So God is going to do the things in your life. He's not going to be on the side consulting. How many of you remember when there were bumper stickers years ago around, and people put them on all over the place, and it said, God is my co-pilot on their car. Man, that made my, the hair stand up on the back of my neck. <laughs> God is not a co-pilot. God is not only the pilot. He's the airplane itself. He's the car itself. He is not. Everything. He's, not, he's, he's everything. everything. He's our everything. So we don't ever need to relegate God into a, an advisory role or a supporting role or a role of, you know, that's just there to, to make sure things get done. He is the performer himself. He brings it to pass in your life. He's the one that takes a hold of that which Christ Jesus took a hold of for us and makes it happen and brings it into, the, into fruition, brings it into manifestation. Amen? You know, we go on to... Um Another part of Abraham, and I think is so amazing, was when, let's read in, in Hebrews 11, verse 17. And it said, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. And he offered, he offered up Isaac on the altar, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, if it was necessary. He, he, he believed that. From which he also received him in a figurative sense. You know, when Abraham went to offer up Isaac in Mount Moriah, if you remember the story, and we're not going to go back and read the story. You can go back and read it on your own. But he told the, the people that went with him, his leaders that were with him, he said, you stay here and wait at the foot of the mountain, and my son and I shall return. That was faith speaking. He said, my son and I shall return. Now, they didn't, nobody knew but Abraham, not even Isaac, what he was about to do. And God asked him, he said, are you willing to give up your only son, the one called this son, 
that was chosen? Have you, are you willing to give him up? Now, you know what this is to represent, what happened with Jesus. So he goes up and he's, he, can you imagine him taking Isaac and putting him on a, up above this fire that's going to be there before he built this fire. And he's, he's tying him to this, looking like he's going to be a rotisserie chicken. Ties him up. And his son said, well, where is the lamb? Where is the sacrifice? And then what did he find? What did he find? A ram in the thicket. God provided. Mount Moriah means God will provide. But Abraham was of the mindset, even if I have to sacrifice my own son, God will raise him up. That's what it's saying in Hebrews. Even if I have to do this. But he had the sense of mind enough to know, or in his heart, he believed God enough that he could say to his leadership, we shall return to you. You know, I believe with all of this, that's why he was chosen as the father of faith for us, the example that we were to follow. But, you know, if you go on, and I want to talk a little bit about the fig tree. When Jesus spoke to the fig tree, and I want to talk about what happened with the disciples. Now, these are men that were with Jesus through his entire ministry and saw miracles, saw Lazarus raised from the dead, saw all these things, saw people healed, and yet look what happened with the fig tree in Mark 11, verse 12. Now, the next day when they had come out of Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it to eat, you know. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not of the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And the disciples heard this. Now, if you skip on down to verse 20, it said, now in the morning... As they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter remembered, saying to him, Rabbi, look! He was in total shock. Now, there's no faith in there, in his conversation there. This is with an exclamation point. Rabbi, look! The fig tree which you cursed is withered away. Well, of course it's withered away. This is the next day, right? Of course it's withered away. Because Jesus spoke words of authority and confession and believing what he spoke. But the disciples, who should have known and had seen Jesus operate, even Abraham didn't see that. But they saw this, and yet they doubted. And Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he said shall be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatsoever, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them. When? When you see them in the natural? No, you believe it when you pray. Believe that you receive them, and you will have them, right? Faith is believing in those things you cannot see with your senses. It's what you cannot see, but you know it in the spirit that it has happened, right? Regardless of what it looks like around you, regardless even if the circumstances seem to get worse, You hold on to faith knowing that God is who he promised he would be and it will come to pass. You know, let me say this. I'm interrupting myself, but this is really good. Many of you know the story about Javan's history, and I'm just going to do just this one section. He had been sick for three and a half years with seizures and, I mean, anything and everything you can imagine. There's no, I can't even get into all of it right now. But I'm going to share this one part of this story because I want to talk to you about faith and how it operates. 
And the doctor told me, and I took Javan in with these symptoms that he had. Van was laid up with a broken leg, and I, had, I went by myself. I felt like I was running an infirmary in my house. And, you know, Van slayed back, his legs up like this. And so I go off to the doctor's office to see what's going on with Javan. Some pretty, he wouldn't get common cold symptoms. He gets spinal meningitis symptoms, deathly things, just crazy stuff. But I got in there, and the doctor said, he's got a, such a severe case of pneumonia, I'm going to put him in the hospital. I said, no, let's don't do that. I said, let me take him home. Just tell me what you want me to do. Let me take him home. And he said, well, if any one of these seven symptoms come on his body, you get him to the emergency room or he could die. He said, if one of these seven symptoms get on his body, he could die. Are you listening to me? I said, yes. And Van and I had been in the Word because Van had been out of work for almost two months by now because he had a broken leg, and that's another story for another time. And... He was trying to become the president of Delta Airlines, and he was working himself to death, and it wasn't God to work by the sweat of your brow, and he realized that. But you know what? That ended up being a turning point in our life because we never had that kind of time together where every day we were spending 6, 7, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 hours in the Word, getting built up in our faith because we were having relationship with the Word, relationship with the Word. And, man, I tell you what, I was so full of faith by this point and I got ready to leave, and the doctor said, are you listening? I'm going to say it one more time. And he went through the whole thing again. He said, I don't know why I'm letting you go home. I said, it's okay. And I left. I got in the car, and I rebuked everything that doctor said. I, I commanded that stuff off of him. And I said, I just rebuked it all. I wouldn't even listen to the report. So I got I, on the way home. I began to just pray and pray in the Spirit and and I got home, and I told Van what the doctor had proclaimed. I didn't say Javan had it. I said, this is what the doctor said. And he, we laid hands on him, and within two days, he was fine. Well, the, then the next day, this is three days later, the next day I had two ladies call me on the phone for ministry. One whose, whose son, I mean, her, his, uh, her, her daughter was very, very sick. I didn't discuss with her anything I was going through. I just prayed for her. I took an hour and spent time ministering to her. Then I get another phone call, and this lady's husband had left her, and so I spent another hour with her. As soon as I hung up by the second phone call, all seven symptoms came on Javan's body, all seven. The day before, I had watched about this woman who was put in prison because she refused medical treatment, and her son died, and she was put in prison. And I'm like, and she was a Christian scientist. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. So I, I went and I sat in this chair, and, and Javan went from no fever to 100, almost 105 in just a, a little bit of time. And he crawled up in my lap in all seven symptoms. And I sat there, and I was so angry. I had a righteous indignation that came over me. And I was determined. I said, that is it. I am done with this. Because I had been so afraid. I used to cry every day in his first three years of his life for fear he wouldn't be alive the next morning. And I was so angry and faith started just, oh, rising up on the inside of me. And I literally went into what I know was a gift of faith. It was beyond me. It was so far beyond me. And in the meantime, now you're going to hear voices, the enemy that will come to you. And he's standing there, and he's on one shoulder, and he's saying to me, and I heard the doctor's voice saying, he could die. And all of a sudden, it became like a demon. He could die. He could die. And I'm going, stop. And I grabbed my head, and I'm like, no. And then I saw this woman in prison and behind bars, and all of a sudden it's me. And I'm like, this is enough. And I said, God, either your word is true or it's a lie. Either by the stripes on Jesus' back we were healed or we weren't. And I'm going to sit here and watch a miracle happen. And I said, you are not a respecter of people. If Sally over here can have a healthy son, then so can I. And I am done with this. And I heard a pastor say one time, he said, singing in the spirit is the highest form of praise. So I just began to sing in the spirit. And Van was praying and singing in the spirit when we were just singing in the spirit. Within 20 minutes, every symptom left that child's body. And from that day to this, he has never missed a day of school sickness. He has never had another seizure. He has never had anything. I'm telling you what, folks, you operate in the gift of faith. I knew I could not do anything for that child in my power. It had to be all God or not God at all. I had nothing in me physically 
to make this happen. But I had to not consider what was going on in that child. As he's looking with me, tears in his face, and I'm just rocking him. And I'm just believing God. I'm telling you what, you cannot consider that symptoms got worse in those 20 minutes. It was the longest 20 minutes. It got worse before it got better. But I refused to accept anything contrary to God's promise and what God performed. Some of you had not heard that story. That's why I wanted to share that much. There was a whole lot more to this. But I'm telling you right now, you stand firm and you believe God and you exercise your faith. And you too can run a triathlon just like David. And you can win because Jesus won it for you. And he'll give you the ability. He'll give you the strength to run the race. And you'll be on the other side. And he's already got the trophy. He's already given it to you. But you have to choose to believe by faith that it was already finished. I had to know that by the stripes on Jesus' back, Javan was already healed. I am not sitting there begging and pleading with God to heal my son and do something. He had done everything he was going to do by putting Jesus on the cross. And Jesus bore stripes. It was already done. I just had to receive it and believe it. To look at Javan today, you would never know he ever had any of those issues. But praise God. Anyway, I got to get on. But I just wanted to share that with you. Now, let me, let me go back to this about the fig tree. Did that minister to anybody hearing that story? Amen. All right, I wanted to share. Some of you have heard it before, but it bears repeating. But let's look at this. It said, now in the morning as they passed by, this is uh, Mark 11, 20 through 24. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And, and Peter, remembering, said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed withered away. So Jesus answered. He said, have the faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast in sea, and does not what doubt in his heart. You cannot have any doubt. At that point, I had no doubt that Javan was going to be totally healed forever. That was it. I was done. I'm not doing this anymore. I drew a line in the sand. I am done with this. And took away all the fear that I had. Was turned into faith and believing. And when it says, you can have whatever you pray when you believe that you receive it, you have it right then. You pray and you ask God for healing. You have not because you ask not. You ask him for a healing And then you believe you have it, and every day from that point on, you don't keep confessing, Lord, heal me. He's already healed you when you ask him the first time. And you just thank him that it's finished. And you thank him that you have the healing, regardless of what your body's screaming out. And you're going to hear more of that in in the service healing school today. You know, but it says in Proverbs um, 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat the fruit of it. You know, if you... You can speak till the cows come home, but if you don't believe it in your heart, you're just wasting breath and wasting words. You, it, I don't care how many times you confess. You know what? You can confess the first time. If you believe it in your heart, you don't have to keep confessing. You just thank him. You come with a heart of thanksgiving and let your request be made known unto God. So faith is coming before God with a knowing and an expectation and a believing and receiving and having it deep in your heart, then you don't keep pleading and begging. It's not a begging. So it's not how many times you can confess that wins a trophy. No, it's believing you receive that won the victory. Amen? If you look at Matthew 17, 14, Matthew 17, 14, and when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic. And suffers severely, for he oftentimes falls in the fire and often in the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it shall move, and nothing will be impossible 
for you. Well, let me say something here. Regina's going to be reading a few verses, and I am too, that's going to take us into a little bit different uh, dimension on faith that we really want to drive home to you today. Um, one of Andrew's first uh, recorded sermons, if you go back a gazillion years ago, in fact, Andrew re referenced this about a, a month or two ago about this particular sermon. And over the years, he, he uh, periodically refers back to it, but it's always, you know, it's always the case. And I have really, Regina and I have really uh, studied this out, and, it, and it, it bears it out. If you use, you know, if you use a version of the Bible, let's say you use the New King James or you use the NIV, you will see in there where he talks about faith in the Son of God. But on many, many scriptures, if you're using like the King James, it talks about the faith of the Son of God. And there is a big difference, and we want to we spend the rest of our time clarifying that and the importance of that because this is a game changer. And, uh, you know, we firmly, firmly believe, and it has really worked for us to believe in and worked for Andrew and I know many, many others, but... When, you when you're dealing about uh, whether you, yes, there, we have faith in the Son of God. That is a true statement. That's not, we don't come against that at all. But it's not about faith in the Son of God. It's about us having the faith of the Son of God residing in us, and we're using his faith, not our own faith. That takes all the pressure off, and it also means that we don't even have to try to muster up faith because it's already inside of us. So go ahead, David. You know, and there's another scripture about the, the disciples and the apostles. You know, when, when they were, when <laughs> Jesus said, it's because of your unbelief, they saw all of these miracles that we weren't there to see all these miracles. They saw them. They watched them happen. But yet he kept saying, oh, perverse generation, how long do I have to be with you? You've seen all these things, and yet you still doubt, and you have unbelief. Well, it goes on in this other verse. It says, and the apostle said to the Lord in Luke 17, verse 5, it says, increase our faith. He said, increase our faith. But what did Jesus say? He said, if you have faith as a mustard seed. How many of you have ever seen a mustard seed? It's the tiniest little bitty seed. And he said, if you have faith as, as a mustard seed, you can save this mulberry tree and be pulled up by the roots and be planted, and it would obey you. Be planted in the seed, and it would obey you. Be uprooted and be cast in the seed. It would obey you by just speaking to it and believing and not doubting and have this much faith. He's telling them this. How long do I have to be with you? See, the disciples, when he was talking about the boy with epilepsy, they could have cast that demon out. They could have done it. They said, why couldn't we do this? He said, because of your unbelief. Now, I want to go on and I want to share this. Y'all, God has given me some huge revelation on the woman with the issue of blood. I'm going to take a few moments to talk about that, and then Van's going to finish up things here. But this is so very important. I want y'all to listen to this. In Mark, and this isn't all of the Gospels. You can find it. But I'm going to read the version in Mark 5, 25 through 34. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. And she spent all that she had, all her earnings, she spent everything, and she was none the better, but grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched the hem of his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power, in the New King James Version, had gone out of him, or virtue, in the King James Version, had gone out of him, he, he turned to the crowd and he said, Who touched me? And, of course, the disciples were looking at him and saying, Are you crazy? There are thousands of people thronging you. You're saying, who touched me? Everybody's touching you. What's wrong with you? I mean, don't you know everybody's touching you? He said, no, but I felt power and virtue go out of me. And he turned to the woman, and he said to her, and she had said to him, she was fearful and trembling, and she told him the whole truth. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And be healed of your affliction. Now, some very important things here, and God showed this to Dora, and God had showed this to me as well. 
that this woman with the issue of blood. Now, keep in mind, everything in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is still part of the old covenant because Jesus had not gone to the cross yet. Everybody understand that? So it's in the New Testament, but until Jesus went to the cross, they were still loving under the law. This woman was living under the law, and under the law, anyone with an issue of blood was considered unclean. And if she had gone out in public, it would make anybody else unclean because anybody who would touch her would become unclean. They could have stoned her to death. Literally, that was the law. You come out here and you're unclean, we can stone you for doing this. So you stay in there. And as she was, she was having this problem for 12 years. Can you imagine being in solitary confinement for 12 years? I'm sure she was probably anemic. I mean, there was all kind of issues here. But she understood. She had the measure of faith to understand. She had a, a faith in her to understand. See, she didn't even, even have the measure of faith yet, and that's what I'm getting ready to explain. She had heard about what Jesus was doing. And she, through her thought pattern and building up her own faith, she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. Now, that means the hem of his garment in the King James Version. She was down crawling on the floor, on the ground, mainly because she didn't want people to see her. She was crawling beneath the people. I mean, I, I, you can only imagine. Just to, if I could just not even, I don't even have to touch him. Just his clothing. I can be made whole. And what did Jesus say? He turned to her. He said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Your faith. See, she wasn't under the new covenant. It wasn't about the faith of Jesus in her because the faith of Jesus wasn't in her. It was her faith. That's why he looked at her. He said, your faith has made you whole. Now, I want to go on. and Let me, let me explain some things. In, in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, just stay with me. and We'll go back to this little woman. I don't know if she was little or not, this woman with the issue of blood. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, this is Romans 12, 3, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, what is that faith? Well, y'all know my favorite verse. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Never now, see, this is, why it's, this is why it's after the cross, all right? So, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but it's Christ that liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the, this is King James Version. New King James says faith in the Son of God. But this is faith of the Son of God, which is a big difference. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I do not frustrate the grace of God for righteousness came by the law, which this woman lived under the law. Then Christ died in vain. Christ had not died yet for this woman. So she had to use her own faith and believe by hearing the testimonies of others. They overcame by the, well, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. But she only had the testimonies. She didn't even have the blood of the Lamb yet. So she had to use her own faith. Now, we, under the new covenant, we don't use our faith. We use his faith because it's no longer we who are living, but it's Jesus who lives in us. And the life which we live in our flesh we live by the faith of the Son of God, which is the measure of faith, Jesus. Do you all understand what I'm saying? So if this woman with the issue of blood could receive her healing, and Jesus looked at her and said, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. See, we can't even say our faith makes us whole because it's Jesus' faith in us. All we're doing is exercising his faith in us. Would you all agree? It's his faith. This is what the word says. The faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. But this was from the foundations of the world. This was the plan. So there is no excuse for anybody in this room not to be able to operate in faith. Because Jesus has given you that gift. 
He has blessed you with faith. It's not how many times you can work something by confessing. 100 times, I confessed 100 times today that God was going to heal me of cancer. Well, that does no good if you don't believe it's going to happen. You're just wasting your time. You're just wasting your time. Bottom line. But if you believe in your heart that he is who he promised he would be and he was able to perform it and he was the one who did it, then you believe that you receive it when you prayed and you asked for it. Then you don't keep asking for something you believe you've already have it. If you believe you already have the healing because you asked him for it, then why do you keep asking him to give it to you? Just because the symptoms have gotten louder. You make a determination in your heart I, like Abraham, will not consider my own body or the symptoms in it. I will not even look at the circumstances of what's going on. Because by his stripes, I was, past tense, healed. It was a part of the atonement package. It is already finished. Faith is only appropriating what Jesus has already provided by the cross. Amen? Do you understand how many of you believe you received? How many of you believe you got this today? All right. I want to go back uh, real quick to uh, the verses that Regina did a, a few minutes ago on Romans 12, verse 3, and just say something about it. It says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. You know, there are versions that say has dealt to every man a measure of faith. That is not correct. It is not a, a meaning this one gets one different size faith, different this. It's one. God is a God of order, and God has given us everything that pertains to life and godly, godliness. He has fully equipped us with everything. So there is only one faith, and that is the faith of the Son of God. And that's what he has given us with the measure of faith. That's the measuring uh, uh, standard that we use is the faith of the Son of God. All right, let's go down here then to look at, at um, Galatians 5.22, which is where the fruit of the Spirit, where we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and where there, against such there is no law. Now, if you look at some of those fruits of the Spirit, you look at, um, say, like love, for the love of God. What kind of love? Love of God. Comes from God. It's God's love. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So the love of God is is already inside of us, so we're operating with His love. If you look up there and you see the, ver a ver the part of that verse about joy, the joy of or from the Lord is our strength. You look at peace, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will rule and reign in our hearts through Christ Jesus. So, then we rock along looking at some of these up. The goodness of God. It's the goodness of God that leads man into repentance. There's that word faith. But it's the faith of God. That's the fruit of the Spirit is the faith of God. Faith of the Son of God or the faith of God in us that produces, which really grabs hold of, the promises, appropriates the promises, appropriates the things, brings them into the, to, to the natural, into the, to manifest. So we're really, bottom line, we are not using our own faith. God made it so that we are dependent on Him. He wants us to be dependent on Him. This is not like we're just codependent. It's not even a code. He's not dependent on us. We're dependent on him, and he wants, us, he wants us not to have self-sufficiency. He wants us to have God-sufficiency. And so we're dependent on him, and, but we're dependent on his faith. And if you look down here at, at um, 
Let's see. Let's look at, uh, well, here's another example. 1 Timothy 1, 1, where it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. You know, there it is. He's our hope. Christ is our hope. That's not one of the fruits of the Spirit there, but He is our hope on, all, on top of everything else. So, in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 1, Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. What is our evidence in that, in that, in that Scripture? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. What is it referring to? What's the evidence? Faith. Look at it again. Now faith is. Is what? The substance of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. But it's not our faith. It's His faith. It takes God's supernatural faith to even receive salvation. We don't have the faith to receive salvation on our own. We're not, we're, we're especially when we're, you know, we're, we have a sin consciousness, we have a, a sin nature, we have, you know, whatever, you know, we've, a lifestyle we've lived, whether it's a good lifestyle or bad style, it's, the Word still says it's but filthy rags. So we have to use, God doesn't even expect us to use our own faith and muster up our own faith to receive something, see, receive His free gift of salvation, but we use the faith of the Son of God to do that. That same faith that belongs to us, the faith, that faith which is a fruit of the Spirit. We use His faith. Now, I say all this, track with me now, because it's important, because we're talking about, yes, about receiving salvation, but that is the course of your walk with God, using His faith. And his faith is not, think about when God uses his faith. God just calls things that be not as though they were. God is not out, call, he's not out uh, calling forth things and, 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 and saying, you know, I'm going to confess this 500 times today. If it happens, if it happens, it's going to happen. I just know it's going to happen. And I just go, I've done it 431 times, and I've just got seven, seven more, ten more times to do it. I'm th Can you see God doing that? What, what did he do with light? Light be. Light be. I mean, that's, that's not, that's, that's calling it forth. Is that right? But he used his own faith. And he expects us to use his, his own faith in our own lives because he lives in us. So we're using his faith to call things that be not as though they were. We're using His faith to call forth and to appropriate the promises of God. We're using His faith to appropriate His promises. We're not using our faith because we, and you know, and you hear people all the time, well, I hear, I mean, we hear this all the time. I guess I just don't have enough faith. No, it's not that we don't have enough faith because we have the measure of faith. We have the faith of the Son of God. The issue is unbelief. Not, not enough faith. We've got faith. We have the measure, the measure, the faith of the Son of God residing in us. And we utilize that just like the love of God which has been shed abroad in our hearts. We use that. We distribute that. But the, the, the sticking point and what, what derails us temporarily for sometimes is unbelief sneaks in there. Unbelief. It's unbelief that kept the, the children of Israel out of the promised land. But unbelief is still, you know, is still around. It will still be around until Jesus comes back for his church. We have to watch out. We have to guard our hearts against unbelief. But realize you have the faith of the Son of God in you as we speak, if you're born again. That's right. 
you have God's faith in you, and we call forth, or we appropriate, or we speak to the mountain, or we, we call, for, we, we, whatever we need to do to appropriate the promises in our lives, we do it with the faith of God that resides inside of us. Now, Romans ten seventeen says, so then faith comes, then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we access God's faith. How do we get to God's faith? We have God's faith. How do we get to that faith that's inside of us? How do we access it? We access it through his word. That's how we access. And you know what? The same way. Did you say that? This, sure. The same way that Jesus accessed his own faith when the devil was there tempting him in the wilderness, what did he, how did he access? It is written. It is written. That is the word speaking the word, using the word. Drawing on the word. Better way to say it. The word drawing on his word and using the word against the enemy. We have the faith. I want everybody to say this together. I have, I have the, faith the faith of the Son of God, of Son of God residing, in me. residing in me. And every promise, and every promise of, God of God belongs to me. I will appropriate that promise by the faith of the Son of God, which is in me and lives in me. No pressure on me because I'm using his faith. Amen? Amen. You know, All right. Let me just add this back to the, the woman with the issue of blood. Y'all, this, this is when Jesus said, power has gone out from me. And virtue has gone out for me. You know, in the Old Covenant, the, the Holy Spirit would come and go. He would come and abide on people for a, for a time, and he would leave. But when Jesus went to heaven, after he had been resurrected, and he, and he had the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection, he said, I am going, but I am sending you to the Comforter, which will abide in you. He will live in you. See, he sent the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. He then gave us, he said in Luke 10, 19, I've given you the power to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power where nothing by any means shall harm you. See, so Jesus has placed within us, because Jesus lives in us, it's no longer we who are living, but it's Jesus in us. He's given us the power. He's given us the faith. He's given us the word. He's made everything simple. So all we have to do is apply the word we speak his word with authority and believe it in our heart, and then we will have whatever we say. We don't just say, see, so many people say, well, Lord, if it's your will, I know that someday you'll heal me. That's just futile words. It, it does nothing. That is faithless words spoken. And for many years of my life, that's how I prayed because that's how I was brought up. Father, if it's your will, then you can heal me. It's always his will. And the way we know it's his will is because Jesus bore the stripes on the cross, and it's finished. It is finished. So I don't care what your body screams out. I don't care what your, your bank account is saying. You have to say, no, it is finished. By his stripes, I was, past tense, healed, and I appropriate, and I thank you, Jesus. I stand on the promise of God. I praise you, and I thank you. You have already given me your virtue. You, have, you are living in me. I don't have to wait for it to come up on me. It is in me. It is in you. Churches are not teaching this, folks. But this is the word. Look at it for yourself. Everything you need is in you because Jesus is everything and he is in you. So regardless of how loud your body's screaming, you just say no. No. 
I do not accept this. By his stripes I was healed. And you just begin to praise him and thank him. Come with a heart of thanksgiving and believe in your heart with the faith that he's given you. And it's really that simple. Now, when we come back, we haven't decided yet whether we're going to do a whole teaching on grace or if we're going to just go to the balance of grace and faith, how you bring the two together because we're in the dispensation of grace now. And, and I, but just you just pray, and we'll, we'll bring what God tells us to. But I'm telling you what, how many of you were ministered to? The, by, did you learn something today? I tell you what, I am excited about what God's doing in this church. You know, I want to add something more to this, too. You know, you need to remind yourself that you have the faith of God, the faith of the Son of God living in you. And when obstacles come your way or you want to appropriate the promises in your life or different things, you're calling forth finances or you're calling forth uh, healing or whatever, you remind yourself and verbally, and this is what I like to do, I said, you know, it's not so much I'm not reminding God, I'm reminding myself when I say it. But I have the faith of God in me. So, Lord, preface it like that. So, Lord, I am calling forth. And right now, I speak to you mountain of, of debt or I speak to you mountain of, 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 of bills or mountain of whatever it is. I speak to you in the name of Jesus, and I am using the faith of the Son of God that lives in me. I don't have to worry if I have enough faith. I don't even have to be concerned about it because I'm using the faith of God. And, and I know that faith of God is, in me is great enough to drive out any doubt that would try to rise up against me, any doubt or unbelief, because I am a finished product of the King. I am a joint heirs with Jesus Christ, and you have gone before me. My joint, the, the one I'm joint heirs with, Jesus Christ, my elder brother, has already paved the way. And so I call it forth right now. I call forth. I, you need a new car? Whatever. I call forth that car because, Lord, you want me to have decent transportation. You want me to have dependable transportation. I'm not asking for a limousine, Lord. I'm asking what I'm calling forth right now. In Jesus' name, I'm calling forth a, a acceptable, good, decent-looking, uh, 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 dependable transportation, Lord. And however you need to get it to me, that's your, your business. But I'm using the faith of the Son of God, and I have a more than a confident expectation. I have a knowing that I have an expected end, and that expected end includes a, a new car for me. It may not be 100% new. It may be a, 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 a pre-owned car, but to me it's going to be new, and I'll get 10 years of driving out of it. And it'll be dependable. And I expect it, and I'm looking for it, and I'm excited, and I'm just so about to jump out of my skin because I don't know if somebody's going to send me a letter. I don't know if somebody's going to stop me at the 7-Eleven or the quick trip. I don't know how it's going to happen, or it's just going to show up in my driveway. But I have a confident expectation that is here because I am using your faith and calling upon your name and I am speaking it and declaring it just like you formed the earth and the, and, and the heavens. And you said, light be, I say, car be in Jesus' name. Amen. And you know what? Then don't come back later and say, after a week and it hadn't happened, say, oh, I guess he doesn't love me. And I guess I'm not going to get anything. And I, Your words, life and death is in the power of your tongue. Watch what you say. You speak what you believe and don't allow doubt and unbelief to cause you to speak contrary because a double-minded man or woman cannot receive anything from God. It's not because God hasn't given it, but it's because you aren't appropriating it the right way. Watch what you say. Don't confess how bad your symptoms are. Just say, I thank you, Lord, that I'm healed in the name of Jesus. And you don't accept anything contrary to perfect divine health. This is how you do it, folks. You just have to be careful. You know, we sat on an airplane with a, a woman yesterday uh, a young girl yesterday, and she had been in, uh, had a, a boyfriend, and things ended, they, they ended up breaking up, and they were, had been very serious, and, and she said, I, I don't know if, if God has a, a spouse for me. I said, do you desire it? She said, oh, yes, I desire it. Then he's given you the desire. You, he's placed the desire in your heart, and so you just, we prayed with her. We prayed with her on the plane. God had us. And I said, this was a divine appointment. God had us on this plane with you. We were coming back from Andrew Womack uh, Conference in Dallas, Texas. And we talked to her the whole way from Dallas here to Atlanta. And we prayed for her. We prayed for uh, her sister and some other things that were going on there. And she said, thank you so much. I really believe this is going to happen. 
And, of course, Van, you know, Van gets these dates. He said, well, before this date, this is going to happen. I mean, he just, you know, she said, really? So I, I'm telling you, God will have you at the right place at the right time to be there to minister to other people. But you have to know how to believe it yourself. And if you have a desire in your heart for something, God said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, get that? You abide in me and my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it will be done for you as long as it's in accordance with the word of God. You can't believe for somebody else's husband or you can't believe for somebody else's car, but yet you can believe God for your own. So anyway, we could go on and on, but I, I think this is where we need to stop today. But y'all, I'm telling you, grab a hold of this. Go back and listen again. And when symptoms try to come on your body, go back and listen to this. And you get that righteous indignation, just like Javan that day when I had, to just, I had to just keep believing, even though the temperature kept going up to close to 105. And any time his fever went over 99, he'd automatically have a seizure. And I'm talking a grandma seizure. We're talking terrible seizures. And it went to almost 105, almost scarlet fever. I, I just kept believing and thanking God and just kept singing in the spirit. And it broke. And all the symptoms left. Y'all, I'm telling you, you can have the same thing. God isn't going to do this for us and not do it for you. And you, you just have to know how. You understand when Regina was talking about the woman, the issue of blood and those different parts in the gospel. There again, they did not have the faith of the Son of God living inside of them. Because Jesus hadn't gone to Jesus the cross Because Jesus hadn't yet. gone, had, hadn't been a death, a burial, and a resurrection for Jesus Christ yet. But she, God, com or Jesus commended her on her faith. Now, the covenant we are on the other side of the cross is Jesus is commending himself on his own faith. That's right. Amen. And you don't have to go and ask God, God, give me your virtue and give me your power. He's already given it to you. You already have it in you. Now just operate in it, okay? All right, stand to your feet if you would.